Hey everyone, we are back and we are going to be looking um, at Japan and really how Japan moved forward as we're looking at period four of AP World and looking at how they changed from where we talked about them last time, which is really them in the feudal period. So we're going to look at the unification of Japan moving away from feudalism and the feudal period and really moving into an urbanized society. Um, that was more unified than it had been before. So as we are about to look at this, we're going to zoom on in here, and this is where we were talking about last time. Uh, last time we talked about Japan, we know that there was an emperor who really didn't have any political power, but the actual ruler was a shogun. And then very much like Europe, there were uh, large landowners or lords. In Japan, we call those the daimyo. And then we have warriors who are loyal to those lords or daimyo. And in Japan that was called the samurai, much like the knights in Europe. And then we know that the peasants were another major class, um, artisans, and then ultimately the merchants, merchants were the lowest class. And we've talked about that before in both Japan and China, how they are seen as lower status um, because ultimately they gained uh, wealth from other people's hard labor and that wasn't very honorable and so we see though that this class is going to start gaining some more influence especially as we move closer to the point where we're going to have huge commercialization and ultimately the industrial revolution but how did that all start so the tokugawa shogunate so we see the word shogun in there and tokugawa is going to be uh, one of these families that are really going to take the lead um, and cause japan to ultimately unify and so the generals or the leaders um, around the shogun for the tokugawa family ultimately unified japan and they were really determined to end this warfare that was happening between different daimyos and so they really moved forward to have a social order where the shogun was ultimately the unifier was in control and then ultimately to check the power of those lords or daimyo in their different regions and so how this kind of all happened the first person so about 1600 is where the tokugawa shogunate began with a person known as tokugawa aisu now he is going to be working um, to stabilize japan and like we said the way to control the daimyo to make sure that they're not fighting with other people and the samurai get involved and it's really kind of kind of like a warring states period in china uh, what he did is he wanted to control if he knew if he could control the daimyo that he would be able to then uh, unify and pacify the population population within Japan and so he did this um, by doing something called like alternate capital years and so what he would do is every other year um, a daimyo and his family would need to spend their time uh, within the capital city of Edo and so then they could go back to the rural areas and their families would be left behind but then they were really spending a lot more money in the city um, it was causing them to become more urbanized and there was less fighting to do because they were spending more of their money in the city and they had to kind of come back and forth and so there was a lot more pomp and circumstance to live in the city uh, more honorable but by doing this it was a way to really pacify the people and cause them to fight less when they're back in their rural areas and we'll talk about some of the other outcomes of them moving more towards the city and using this tool of alternate capital years uh, for the daimyo to live in and he was going to really be the one that really set this out and he's going to set up um, a really good case of kind of an organized government within Japan. Now um, something that's really unique though about this time is foreign relations are not going to be as great um, in the ways from those that are outside of Japan. As Japan they're thinking that this is splendid. Um, basically they're going to, the shogun is going to really closely control relations outside Japan um, as they really believe that European culture uh, was really influencing their country and they wanted to get rid of that and so they moved towards isolation which we've seen uh, China do many times before in history and so we see here they forbade European imports um, with the exception of Chinese and Dutch imports um, and so they really uh, didn't look outside of Japan for anything. They prohibited shipbuilding, which if we kind of take that and analyze that, we're looking at, well, if they couldn't build ships, that means they couldn't really travel, which means that other ships couldn't really come in there and being involved in trade is usually a two-way street. And so this is a way that they really move towards isolationism. And then they also persecuted Christians um, as Christianity was a foreign religion. And as we've looked at before, um, the, the really big three religions that we've seen or philosophy within Japan have been Confucianism which is more of a philosophy we know that Buddhism spread there especially Zen Buddhism and then also Shintoism and so Christianity was a foreign religion and again as they're kind of going back to their core values of Japan they moved towards really things that were 
true to their country. And so they moved away from things that would be seen as outside, and that would include Christianity. And so foreign relations were really different, and we see the exceptions there for the Chinese and the Dutch, and we'll talk about that as we move forward <laughs> right now. The Dutch connection... Um, the Dutch are going to actually help the Tokugawa shogunate um, stop Christian Japanese, an uprising that occurs there. And so the Dutch are kind of seen as like their allies. And so they kind of kept them apprised of what was happening in Europe. And they were their one European connection. So the Dutch and the Japanese would be something key to remember here. Um, they were their only trading partner. And there's a primary source um, of information about Japan. And so we see things of how ultimately we keep getting information to Japan through the Dutch so they were kept up to date they didn't fall behind they were at outside the loop um, because of this Dutch connection so they were that primary source of information for the Japanese now um, this picture as you kind of look at it we're gonna see as shipbuilding uh, obviously declined we're gonna see that in time once we get into the 1800s um, the ships are gonna really change this in a way. And we're going to talk about Matthew Perry sometime and how Matthew Perry, years and years forward from where we are right now, is going to force open Japan to being open to trade, which is really a unique thing that's going to happen, but that's on the horizon. And so this picture just kind of exemplifies that. Now, impacts on Japan from all these things, the Tokugawa shogunate, if you're thinking of like cause and effect, things that happened. Um, one a big major effect was ultimately they pacified the population, but in some, many would argue that they really didn't truly unify it. Um, they just set up strict regulations that kept peace, and so they weren't fighting, but they weren't truly unified. And they kept them kind of pacified by having strict laws on dress and behavior and different laws. Um, but again, it wasn't a true unified, as they would argue, many would say. Now the social structure um, with the shogun on the top, and then it's going to be followed up by samurai, peasants, artisans, and then ultimately merchants, which is very similar still. However, now that samurai class is going to be more of a bureaucratic position um, because samurai were known for fighting um, and protecting the daimyo. Now they're going to be more of a government position or administrative class. So very different than we've seen before, um, but they still really uphold those values of the samurai, those that really focused on sacrifice and loyalty and honor, but now it's going to be more of a government position than it is going to be a true fighting position. And we've seen um, the last samurai popular movie. Um, you can kind of see that struggle as well um, in that movie that kind of plays out in the future as well. That's kind of beyond where we are right now in history but something to look at. Um, it also caused a lot of economic growth in Japan, which is strange when you think about it at first because you're like, well, they're not really trading with other, other people, but they're really moving away from being a rural population to more of an ur urban population. So there's a lot of urban development as the daimyo are living in cities, um, and we're going to really set the stage, as you see in the bottom, for the Industrial Revolution because of these things. And because Confucianism is still a large impact within Japan, we see that they have a very literate and educated population. Um, so combine all those things together, they are really ripe for the Industrial Revolution that will happen as we kind of fast forward into the next period. But for period four, we see that um, unlike what we talked about in period three in Japan, where it's a feudal society, in period four, we're seeing Japan really move forward, especially around 1600, um, to a point where they're unified under the shogun and pacified, ultimately, where they're not fighting. And then that is kind of this period where they're going to grow become more urbanized and ultimately um, be ready for what we're going to talk about in the next period, period five, about the Industrial Revolution. So hopefully that was helpful to bridge the gap and kind of remind us of what we learned before about Japan and set the stage for what we're going to learn in the future.